Good day to you. I'm Dr. Tim Wakefield, and it's my pleasure to serve as your presenter today as we look at the topic of disruptions to ecosystems, which is, of course, a part of the ecology unit. I'm coming to you today from the beautiful campus of John Brown University, which is tucked away in the northwest corner of the state of Arkansas. We have a beautiful campus here, internationally recognized as a top tier school. I would invite you to check out our website to see if JVU might be a school you would want to add to your list of possible colleges for the future. But without any further ado, let's jump into the topic of ecosystem disruption. When I ask my students for examples of events that could cause severe ecosystem disruption, this is usually one of the first ones that is mentioned. Everyone wants to go big. Meteor impacts, massive flooding, volcanic eruptions, these are the first things that they consider. This is probably because most students are aware of the asteroid impact called the KT event that was responsible for the extinction of the dinosaurs. Although most are familiar with the KT event, they really don't have many of the details. About 65 million years ago, when the world was populated by a large diversity of dinosaurs and the only mammals were tiny shrew-like critters hiding underground or in the shadows of walking giants, an asteroid at least as large as Mount Everest slammed into the Gulf of Mexico. Traveling at approximately 45,000 miles per hour, the asteroid collided with the Earth just north of the present day Yucatan Peninsula. The impact produced an estimated 100 million megaton blast that scoured the landscape of both North and South America, killing everything in its path. By the way, a 100 million megaton blast is estimated to be 9 billion times as large as the blast produced by the World War II atomic bomb. The debris smoke and ash ejected into the Earth's atmosphere blocked out all of the sun's light for at least a year, resulting in widespread plant and algae life uh, loss. So all of the plants and algae died, which of course led to the loss of herbivores, which led to the loss of carnivores. In all, it's estimated that about 80% of all the Earth's species went extinct as a result of this event. Now, as bad as that is, the KT mass extinction event is only ranked third in the list of major extinction events known to have occurred here on Earth. Fossil evidence indicates that of the five mass extinction events, the Permian was by far the worst. Although it's still debated, it is thought that massive volcanic eruptions were the primary cause. Toxic gas, ocean acidification, and perhaps a loss of the ozone caused a loss of 95% of all living species over a 50,000 year uh, period of time. Although mass extinction events cause a massive loss in biodiversity, this graph also shows something amazing. And that is that life rebounds. After each extinction event, there is a return of biodiversity on our planet. We are currently hosting the highest level of biodiversity to ever exist on Earth, somewhere between 10 to 100 million species. But many of the world's scientists are convinced that we are on the verge of a sixth mass extinction event. But this time it isn't an asteroid or volcanoes that are the cause. This time it is humans that are responsible. As this graph shows, there is a strong correlation between the growth in the human population and the extinction of species. What is it about the growth in human population that is causing so many extinctions? According to one team of scientists, there are four specific ways that humans are disrupting ecosystems and starting the sixth mass extinction. First, humans have become the top predator in every ecosystem. 
Second, humans have caused the spread of invasive species across the earth. Third, humans have created something called the technosphere. And finally, humans are increasingly directing the evolution of other species. Individually, each one of these would cause significant ecosystem disruption. But the combined effect of all four is producing so much disruption that we are pushing toward a sixth mass extinction. Let's discuss each of these human disruptions in more detail to see how. To begin, you should remember that all organisms have become adapted to their ecosystems over millions of years of evolution. Every part of that ecosystem plays a part in the survival of all the other parts. This interaction is illustrated in these diagrams that show the, co the connections between organisms in a marine ecosystem and also a forest ecosystem. Bacteria, diatoms, copepods, worms, squid, wolves, and scores of different species of organisms are all connected. And when any part becomes disrupted, it will affect all the others. The severity of that effect can differ though, depending on what species that you're looking at. Some organisms are highly susceptible to ecosystem disruption, while others are less so. Those that are highly susceptible are referred to as specialist species. They're specialists because they have a very narrow niche. That is, they can only survive within an extremely small range of environmental conditions. Anything about the life history, the behavior, or habitat that causes these organisms to be special perches them on the edge of extinction. A good example of a specialist organism is the koala because it only eats one kind of food, eucalyptus leaves. The opposite of a specialist species is a generalist species. They are generalist because they have a broad niche. That is, they can survive in a wide range of environmental conditions. They don't require special temperatures or habitats or food sources. Instead, they can survive in spite of changing environmental conditions. Good example of a generalist organism is the North American opossum. The opossum, like the koala, is a marsupial, but it is the only remaining marsupial on the North American continent. And this is due in large part to the fact that it is a generalist species. With this understanding, a discerning student could ask, why do species become specialists at all? With their high susceptibility to extinction, it seems that natural selection would always select for generalists and against specialist species. This is an astute observation. But the reason why there are so many specialist species is because of competition. Imagine an ecosystem where there are many generalist species, each with a broad niche. As this figure illustrates, each species will experience a high level of niche overlap, leading to a high degree of competition amongst the species. Interspecific competition can be very severe, and it can lead to a phenomenon called competitive exclusion. Competitive exclusion occurs when one species drives another out of the ecosystem or into extinction due to severe competition. One way to reduce interspecific competition is for a species to narrow its niche. In other words, to become more specialized. As species become more specialized, the level of interspecific competition declines. And as long as ecosystems remain relatively stable, this tendency to reduce competition through specialization can be very successful and lead to healthy, thriving populations. Understanding this concept is essential to understand how human populations are causing the extinction of other species. There has never been a more populous, generalist species than Homo sapiens. 
modern humans have only existed on the earth for about 200,000 years. But in that time, they have migrated and moved across the globe, becoming the most ubiquitous animal species to ever exist on the planet. We can live in snowy climates, in tropical climates, in mountainous climates. We can live in deserts, in swamps, in grasslands, and in forests. Because we can live almost everywhere, we compete with every other organism for habitat and space. Not only do we live everywhere, we eat everything. Humans eat grains, seeds, nuts, fruits, vegetables, leaves, algae, insects, crustaceans, jellyfish, snails, squid, fish, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. Because we can live just about everywhere and we can eat just about everything, humanity is gobbling up 25 to 40 percent of the earth's food energy resources. In other words, we are the top predator in every ecosystem. Our species is so adaptable that we can simply outcompete any other species and literally drive it to extinction. This is the first way in which we are disrupting ecosystems. Another way we disrupt ecosystems is by introducing non-native organisms into environments in which they do not belong. Some of this was intentional and began as humans migrated from one part of the world to another. We didn't just bring ourselves, we brought all the domesticated plants and animals that made life great for us. For example, in the 1600s, European settlers in Virginia brought their honeybees with them. More and more bees were brought to North America as more settlers arrived. And this is why a third of the crops grown in the United States rely on European honeybees for pollination. Because they are now so common, most people in the U.S. are not even aware that honeybees are a non-native species. Alternatively, when humans traveled to new worlds, we often discovered new plants and animal species and brought them back home with us. Although it's hard to imagine, there was a time when Italian food did not include any type of tomato sauce. Tomatoes were brought from South America to Italy in the 1500s, but they did not become a regular part of Italian cuisine until the 1800s. Now tomatoes are grown everywhere in Italy. In 1876, the Japanese plant kudzu was introduced to the United States at the World Fair in Philadelphia. Hoping to use it to prevent soil erosion problems, it was widely planted in the South in the 1930s and 40s. Now, hundreds of acres of land are completely covered over by this fast growing invasive plant. However, some of the introduction of invasive species was not intentional. Some animals simply hitched rides with humans moving from one location to another. For example, sailing ships leaving China or India also transported unwanted passengers, namely black and brown rats, which can now be found in almost every part of the world. None of this spreading of species across the globe would have been possible without people. And the introduction of non-native species can introduce such strong interspecific competition that native species are simply pushed to extinction. The third way that humans have disrupted ecosystems is through the creation of the technosphere. The technosphere is a worldwide energy consuming social technical system comprised of humans and all of our technology. It is the technosphere that is responsible for the myriad types of human pollution. It is the technosphere that is responsible for the human caused changes to our global climate. It is the technosphere that enables humans to cloister into cities and consume enormous quantities of natural resources while also producing uncountable loads of waste. By the very fact that you are watching this presentation, you should recognize that you are part of and contributing to the technosphere, 
and thus you are also contributing to the next mass extinction event. The final way that humans are disrupting ecosystems is by taking over the process of evolution. This is most easily seen through the domestication of plant and animal species. For example, around 8,500 years ago, humans in southwestern Mexico began tinkering with a grass called teacente. They wanted to use the seeds of this grass as a source of food. Through artificial selection, they eventually began cultivating maize or corn. Corn is now the second most abundant cereal crop grown for human consumption. More than 1 billion metric tons of it is produced in 164 countries around the world. Much, much earlier, between 40,000 to 20,000 years ago, packs of wolves began following human hunting clans, eating the scraps left behind by these nomadic people. The more curious and docile of these wolves moved even closer to the camps and these migratory humans, and thus they got more scraps and thus they survived harsh winters. This allowed these wolves to pass on their docile, people-friendly genes to their offspring. And thus wolves eventually were domesticated into dogs. Through artificial selection, dog characteristics have been shaped and changed to the point that we now have 195 different dog breeds around the world. Recently, human tinkering with the evolution of organisms has gone even deeper through accessing the genetic code. Scientists now have the ability to alter or add segments of the DNA molecule to plants and animals. For example, researchers have created genes that give plants resistance to certain types of herbicides. By introducing these genes into crop plants, farmers are able to spray chemicals directly onto the crops, killing weeds without causing damage to the plants. Swapping and stacking genes has happened as these plants have hybridized by cross-pollinating with wild plants. And now these wild plants are showing multiple types of resistance. This is bad news as many of these wild plants are pest species. Now these weeds will have even greater resistance to the herbicides than the crops. And they are not isolated to just agricultural areas, but are spreading everywhere. The full impact of this type of ecological dis disruption is still not known. Even conservation efforts by humans is a type of ecosystem disruption. Our hearts might be in the right place, but due to the interconnected nature of biotic and abiotic ecosystem factors, our interference has an effect on all parts of the ecosystem. We may be aiming for one effect, like preservation of a species, but may cause unintended effects that could result in severe ecosystem disruption. Now, up to this point, we have considered ecosystem disruption in a mostly theoretical framework. But let's look now at some very specific examples of extinctions caused primarily through human ecosystem disruption. The largest member of the order Sirenia, which includes the manatees and the dugongs, was an animal called the Stellar's sea cow. Fossil evidence suggests that during prehistoric times, it ranged from Alaska to California and from the west coast of the US all the way to Japan. Stellar sea cows were a docile, slow-moving, kelp-eating mammal. These sea cows were easy prey for prehistoric indigenous people living in these coastal areas. Because sea cows were positively buoyant, meaning that they floated at the surface, they were easily spotted by indigenous hunters who valued both their meat and blubber. By 1741, when German naturalist George Wilhelm Steller discovered them and described them in his book, The Beasts of the Sea, their range had diminished to the coast of Siberia and Alaska. 
18th century Russian and European fur traders and hunters also found them easy prey and the species was hunted to extinction only 27 years after being described by Stiller. A similar fate was suffered by the dodo, the quagga, the passenger pigeon, and many, many other species, all hunted by humans for food, for sport, or for trophies. Our ability to serve as the top predator in every ecosystem has proven disastrous by, uh, for a large number of animal species. As far as the extinctions due to human introduction of invasive species, there is no better case study than the island of Guam. Guam is a tiny island nation in the Pacific Ocean between Japan and Papua New Guinea. It was a strategic location during World War II with two major battles being fought there between the Japanese and allied forces. After the war, much of Guam's agricultural areas and farms were abandoned. To control for erosion, the US Navy encouraged the spread of Tangentangan seeds throughout the island. These trees were first introduced to Guam in the 1600s by Spanish sailors who brought them from Central America. But after World War II, Guam civilians were paid to collect and spread the seeds everywhere to revegetate the island. This tree is now considered one of the 100 worst invasive species by the International Union for the Conservation of Species. Also after the war, aircraft and ships sailing from Australia or Papua New Guinea to Guam inadvertently carried specimens of the brown tree snake to the island of Guam. With no native predators and an ample food supply, the invading snake population exploded. There are now an estimated 2 million brown tree snakes on Guam. The loss of native tree habits, habitats and the introduction of an unchecked predator has devastated the native bird species in Guam. One endemic species is completely extinct. Several others only exist in captivity or on other islands, but they are extinct on Guam. It could be possible to reintroduce some of Guam's native birds to the islands. However, the snake population still persists and the Tangan Tangan trees have replaced much of the native forest, making many scientists wonder if the birds will ever be able to return to their native home. What about extinctions caused by the technosphere? This gets very complex because although the technosphere is not directly responsible for extinction, in other words, people aren't killing animals with their cell phones, the secondary effects of the technosphere, such as habitat destruction, pollution, and climate effects have led to many extinctions. So technically, the creation and ongoing growth of the technosphere may be a greater source of extinction events than hunting or invasive species. Here's an example of what I mean. Modern technology requires many kinds of rare metals, such as gold, copper, nickel, cobalt, manganese, and iron. These metals are critically important for all kinds of modern technology, from smartphones, to electric cars, to wind turbines, and even F-35 military jets. Unfortunately, terrestrial mines are producing less and less of these metals each year, and the amount of environmental damage caused by these mining operations is significant. However, there is another source for these metals, and it's the ocean floor. Scattered across the seafloor in international waters are huge deposits of polymetallic, sorry, polymetallic nodules. Hydrothermal vent areas and seamounts also contain large deposits of sulfides and cobalt. All of these resources represent 
a very real alternative to surface mining, but at what cost? Mining these areas of the seafloor will require sophisticated underwater machinery and processing ships. And one of the side effects will be enormous plumes of sediment. It has been estimated that for every 10,000 metric tons of needed minerals that are mined, 40,000 metric tons of sediment will be released into the water. And this is a per day estimate. What will happen to all of that suspended sediment? Well, benthic fauna, that is organisms that live on the bottom, down current from the mining operation will be either smothered or entombed as the sediment settles to the bottom. Phytoplankton, that's single-celled algae, could experience a reduction in light levels leading to less photosynthesis and thus less oxygen production. Trace heavy metals like copper and lead could begin to accumulate in ocean food webs, leading to detrimental effects on fish, shellfish, marine birds, in mammals. In other words, deep sea mining could, lo could lead to an environmental disaster on a global scale. Also, we have barely scratched the surface of understanding when it comes to hydrothermal vent and seamount ecosystems. It is a distinct possibility that deep sea mining will destroy these ecosystems and all of their species before we even understand their value in the biosphere. However, the push for deep sea mining is moving full steam ahead. Why? because we all want our big screen TVs, the latest smartphone, our battery operated cars, etc. The ever growing technosphere could be the closest thing to an asteroid impact as far as causing another mass extinction. What about extinctions caused by human interference in evolution or extinction due to conservation efforts? Putting our finger on an extinction caused by these things is much more difficult because these human effects are much more subtle. But let me give you an example of how even the best intentions can lead to unforeseen outcomes. Based on scientific research that found that all marine mammal populations within the U.S. were critically endangered, the Congress passed the Marine Mammals Act in 1972. This act prohibits the taking of any marine mammals within the waters of the US. Taking is interpreted to mean killing, capture, or harassment of any kind, or the attempt to do any of the above. Many people point at the Marine Mammals Act as a great success, as many populations of marine mammals have rebounded from all-time lows to all-time highs in population numbers. One such animal is the California sea lion. In the 1960s, the population had reached less than 30,000 individuals. Thanks to the Marine Mammals Protection Act, the population reached a high of 306,000 in 2012. It's estimated that the sea lions have now reached their carrying capacity for their ecosystem, and this is good news. But it has also caused a significant problem because sea lions love to eat salmon. In the Pacific Northwest, that is Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia, 19 populations of wild salmon are listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. The historical range of salmon populations has seen a 40% reduction. There are many threats to salmon populations, including overfishing, dams that prevent migration, pollution in the waters, and predators. Each summer, sea lions breed in northern Mexico and California, and then the males begin migrating north up the coast looking for food, and what they find is endangered salmon moving back into their rivers to spawn. But before they can get there, sea lions kill and consume an enormous number of them. Sea lions can now be found in large numbers in places where spawning salmon congregate as they move into their rivers and streams. 
It is basically a buffet for the sea lions because they are eating the fish before they spawn. The sea lions are reducing current populations as well as preventing the production of future populations. Unfortunately, due to the Marine Mammals Protection Act, killing or even harassing sea lions was a federal offense. Fortunately, the laws have been changed slightly to try and protect the endangered salmon, but killing a sea lion in order to save salmon still requires special authorization. This is just one example of how humans can cause damage to ecosystems through the unintended outcome of activity done with the best intentions. As human populations continue to grow, and as our interference in normal ecosystem processes continue to expand, and as the negative effects of the technosphere continue to increase, we will see more and more extinction events across the planet. It is possible that just like a house of cards, the global ecosystem will reach a point of instability and the whole thing will collapse into another mass extinction event. But just because it's possible does not mean it is inevitable. If you have understood this presentation, you can work to reverse the impact of human disruptions on ecosystems. I challenge you to do some of your own research and find ways you and your class can lower your disruptive effects on the ecosystem and then implement the changes necessary. I can assure you that it will require a sacrifice on your part. So the question is, what are you ready to give up to save another species? Thank you for your attention and I hope that you have a great school year.